it's the internet you're busy let's do this for march 14th 2024 i think that date's right for the next hour or so let me help you sort through the world of gaming on game mess mornings live with me jeff grubb today we got the official dates for summer game fest and just how important is gta 6 to the video game industry but first please join me in welcoming today's co-host to game mess mornings it's jan ochoa everybody jan how are you doing I'm doing great. I put this on my Notion calendar. I'm blocked <laughs> out, bricked up, baby. That's what uh, that means, right? I think that's what bricked up means. That's what how it's always the way I've used it, and I've been thrown out of many places for using it that way. I don't get it. Um, Jan, when you, uh, yeah, you have the templates. Could you, uh, share me the one you think is the most useful, uh, if that's like a thing grub, you could do. I'm still drowning in them, but yeah. I, I'll do that. Yeah. I'll do that. I don't, I'll do that, and then we'll we'll be vaguely organized together. Vaguely organized. Yeah, I, 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 I never am able to maintain the momentum with any of these efforts. They always just kind of fall the wayside. So it's like having a daily show is like about as much organization as I can handle. <laughs> <laughs> like just doing Bro, this. this. We is can it. be accountability buddies. Okay. I mean, if you want to go down that road, we can. <laughs> <laughs> I okay, Grub. I was showing my partner my my Notion calendar, and for folks that don't know, Notion is like a planning journaling website app uh, that goes through your phone and your p computer, whatever. Uh, she looked at my calendar, and then she looked at me, and then she looked at the calendar again, and she looked at me, and she was like, "Did you? Are you sure you did this? Did you get someone else to do this?" <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Well, that's something. I was like, you jerk! I did put putting the dishes on my calendar. <laughs> I bricked it off. I did. Uh... I did do the thing last night where it's like we're trying to get the kids to bed and and stuff's like dishes. I'm like okay, and I I'm like no, I'm not gonna just do the dishes. I I've been like I didn't clean the house last weekend and I've felt like shit since then. So I just stayed up to like 1 a.m. cleaning the house downstairs. So the whole whole first floor is now good to go. Uh, nice. And I'm feeling I'm feeling I got a little bit of skip in my step now because of it. So there that that go. was something. Uh, and I, I don't know. I think if I tried to put that in the calendar of like hey this is the cleaning block i don't it's that sounds nice that sounds okay. good all right i will develop a template and i will share it with you and i'll share it with the giant bomb audience and it'll just have like a, a to-do list on one side all right and we wait out the tasks to uh, equate to points okay. all right and then we uh, tally up the points either at the end of the day or the end of the week and see who has the most points okay I'm down. And then whoever wins m the most weeks in a month, someone will buy them a pizza. Yeah. They get to play as Mace Windu in Star Wars Battlefront 2. They get first dead. Oh, I want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds pretty fun to me. Uh, let's explain what we do here. Most weekdays, I, Jeff Grubb, will help piece your gaming life back together. That includes breaking news and maybe even some of our own original reporting. For all these topics, I'll get the input of a bona fide expert who will make me look smart. If you were watching live on Twitch, welcome. You can always listen to the show later on podcast feeds by searching for Game Mess Warnings or find the RSS on GiantBomb.com. You can also catch the show later with chapters and timestamps on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. All right, we have a lot to get into, so let's start the morning mess with U.S. game spending could be down 10% this year. This is from Andy Robinson at VGC. U.S. consumer spending on games could decline by 10% this year, according to market research firm Circana. Circana? Circana. Analyst Matt, P Matt Piscatella told GamesIndustry.biz that this figure was in the pessimistic range of what could play out in the U.S. market in 2024, but predicted a tough nine months ahead, even if spend is on the more positive end of the spectrum. Right now, my most optimistic outlook is down 2%, Piscatella said. If you start looking a little bit on the more pessimistic side, you're looking at down to about 10%. If things really go sideways, you're looking a little bit more than that. There's so much uncertainty when you look at the sales data or look to project this year. There's uncertainty around the hardware. There's uncertainty uh, about the content. Who the hell is making the games? says uh, 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 Matt Piscatello over there. He does also mention GTA 6, which is now not coming out till 2025. You know, there was always the chance it could come out this year. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, there was, a, he also mentioned Switch 2 moving internally from this year to next year. There are 
mitigating circumstances that cause people to be like, well, you know, the things that were going to be these big pillars that were going to hold up the industry, they're not happening. So then the, that, that's where that uncertainty comes in. And we're like, uh. but overall, Jan, like we, we know that this uncertainty, uncertainty is like much bigger than just a couple of things not coming out this year. It really is like, what is the state of making these big games? And I'm starting, I'm leaning more and more towards it. This is, this is just a big shift. This is going to be a major shift. And I, I, I'm not going to be like pessimistic like I was with mobile gaming in like the 2012 to like 2016, where it's like it's just these games and only these games can succeed. I think there, that's mm -hmm. how I feel some of the time right now, where it's just Fortnite, it's Minecraft, it's a handful of other things, and you know Matt calls them black hole games. Everything gets sucked into the, into the black hole of these games, and I think there is definitely like we have to recognize yes that is taking up all this time but one thing with the like hardcore gaming is it always changes it's never the same for that long and there will be something new and shiny that will attract people in a couple of years as long as these companies keep making games or someone keeps making games I suppose it doesn't have to be any of these companies but 2024 is going to be rough right yeah you know we say that 2024 is going to be rough yet the beginning of like these first three months into 2024, I feel like has been absolutely back to back to back bangers left and right. Right. And uh, Greb, sorry, I didn't re read the story yet. But so this is t down 10% from last year, which is still kind of recovering off of whatever inflated numbers we got because of like peak pandemic COVID years, right? Yeah, yeah. So this would be Circana, which would be the NPD. So it's the United right. States for one. And it would be, I'm trying to remember, I think spending in 2023 was up about one to one and a half percent in the Got United it. States from uh, the previous year. Now, of course, if you went, once you factor in inflation, that's a little, that's down a little bit, but, sure. but overall that's like, yeah, you know, it's maintaining a lot of the growth that came out of 2022, which I think was still up over 2021, which was up way over 2020, which was up way over 2019. So mm -hmm. there is still a lot of like built in, uh, growth that happened during the pandemic the big trouble for a lot of these companies this was something we'll go back to over and over again is they factored in continued growth at that rate set their businesses up on that assumption and now things are leveling off not necessarily yeah. dropping down they might drop down this year that that does seem like that's really in the cards uh but e even before this but when it wasn't dropping down they were like oh we, we expected a huge growth and we're getting three percent growth. That's not enough to fund everything that we're put we're putting bets on, right? Yeah, I I don't want to also have a pessimistic outlook, but you know, I looking at those back to back to back bangers, those audiences aren't like the wider general gaming audiences. For as much as like Infinite Wealth sold really well, and yeah, Unicorn Overlord is selling really well, yeah, as well. Um, I don't think your regular gamer visiting Target, Walmart for uh, physical releases is going to see that and be inclined to go pick it up, especially when the carton of eggs that they're also at Target or Walmart for is now suddenly $10. Yes, that's, of course, the other thing here. And, and Matt has talked about this on, on Twitter this week, where he's like, yeah, the, people are spending way more on just daily necessities, and that is that is going to take away from game spending in a very noticeable way. A lot of yeah. that's going to be money taken away from like hey i i do get on every week with my buddies and play Fortnite, and you know one of them is you know they're still doing that every night and another one like well, she's over here like she's like she's not playing as much and so i'm like um oh, maybe i won't get on as frequently and by just you know the way numbers work that is going to lower the opportunity for the people to want to spend money yeah. in these games and we're going to see that sort of uh, uh filter down i and we're talking about like big games that have already made a ton of money, not mm -hmm. necessarily new games coming out and selling. Um, and that's the, 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 the tail that wags the dog now are these handful of big games. And if spending drops on those, the whole industry sort of drops overall. You, you mentioned yeah. a lot of new games are doing very well. I mean, Helldivers 2 clearly is a huge, massive blowout success. Mm -hmm. So it's like that can happen. Um, but it's uh, it's not going to fill in the comparison to previous years where we've had, you know, Elden Ring two years ago and several big games last year, including like Zelda yeah, and stuff. I, I, int interesting to bring up Helldivers 2, and I think Matt also brings it up in the story, glancing at it, uh, but like Helldivers 2 and Pal World kind of set the world on fire, even yep. though, you know, kind of 
flash in the pan for pal world but hell divers 2 has had sustained growth um those are cheaper titles as well like yeah, coming out point. at 40 bucks a pop so i think if i was that gamer in that position of playing your weekly cod games with your friends or Fortnite with your friends and this is a cheaper title that you can play with your friends um and like the the buy-in is just at forty dollars i think i'd be more willing to shell out forty dollars rather than seventy dollars to play something like suicide squad or yep. uh however much skull and bones is even though i skull and bones they were trying to give that away for free for a while yeah yeah i think that one's also isn't that one also 70 it's at least 60 right i mean it's I a quadruple so. a game quadruple bro. a like, game. You gotta pay. <laughs> right uh, that's that's what the quadruple a thing was all about was him defending the price of it so yeah mm -hmm. I, I you're, you're absolutely right like you like the uh, matt says hell divers 2 and pal world have done a lot of heavy lifting earlier in the year but we're up against comparisons last year with hogwarts legacy which was a massive hit and he didn't even mention what you said like Hogwarts Legacy, I think, was, it was at least 60, it was probably 70. Again, I can't keep track of all these, but at the very least, 60. And then we have these two games that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but at $40 and, you know, not even necessarily across every console the way Hogwarts Legacy did. So it, th that's part of it. Like, it, it's about comparisons. Last year had several big games. Hogwarts Legacy, mm -hmm. uh, Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, sold 20 million copies in a handful of months. Um, there was games just all throughout the year that were hitting very hard. And th this year, it's like, even if they do hit just about as hard, it doesn't feel like we are, we're going to have both a Hogwarts legacy and a Zelda, uh, like anything comparable to that this year. So, yeah. you know, is that really like, oh, is that the industry drooping overall? It's like, well, no, actually, yes. In a few places it is. Um, but it's not, it's not like, a, again, a rushing out of funds from the industry. It's not like people are losing interest overall and spending money in, on games. They are just being a little bit more selective with where they're putting their dollars. And the problem that goes back to, once again, these companies having astronomical projections and that gap being so huge that it's, that it's, it has to be sort of painful for, the, for now for everyone else, um, uh, mm -hmm. because they miss, uh, misallocated their predictions. You have to think, Grub, that like the frequency of these games dropping also has to play a factor into like reduced spending because with all of these games coming out in such close proximity, um, I'd have to imagine I'd be pinching my pennies as well because, all right, well, I know that this game is going to take me at least 40 to 60 hours to complete a main story, not in even including any of the side content. So that's going to last me if I'm just like casually playing a game a couple times per week or whatever, or even trying to platinum a game, that's going to take me a, a decent chunk of time that I can save that 70, 60 to $70 on another game in a month and a half or two months down the line. Uh, and then it's the same pattern, especially with like these big JRPG style games coming out. Yes. I, and I think uh, people are very happy to just like pick their games once they have them. Like if you got everybody, totally. if you got everybody in on Helldivers two, you're not sitting around looking for the next game to come out. You are like, hey, no, let's go back. We have already spent money on this. We're having a good time. Why mess with a good thing? Like I think there there's a time in gaming where everyone's like, hey, no, we're jumping from game to game. That's what our crew does. Yeah. And I think this year feels like a year where no, we're very cool just playing Helldivers two, and when we're not doing that. When everyone's busy, we're playing Bellatro, and we're playing a ton of that. And these games are selling. And, yeah. and but I think like the behavior of jumping from game to game and going from seventy dollar game to seventy dollar game, I think we've already seen people not jump on Foam Stars, people not drop, jump, <laughs> jump on Sea of Thieves, but season uh, two, su su season two of Foam Stars, Suicide Squad, like it's already happened. I think if we get through the, this year, uh, we're gonna we're gonna look back and see that that was a trend that continued where people were just very happy to stick with what works for them. A trend that I hope continues, and you and Lex highlighted this yesterday on Game Mess, but I really enjoy, despite me not participating in it as much, but I, I love watching the periphery of how Helldivers 2 is rolling out new content. It just feels yeah. so fresh. It's so cool. It, it feels like you have to be playing or like you're watching along in like, it feels like world news popping off yeah. in the world of Helldivers 2 um, in such a way where like, you know, new updates roll out all the time in Fortnite, PUBG, Call of Duty, and then, you know, I'll occasionally check out Fortnite, but I don't quite care. I think I've been conditioned by, like, the seasons model to, like, all right, if I'm not buying in this season, 
I'll wait. I'll check out next season. So far with Helldivers 2, I'm like itching like every single meeting we have of like, well, what if we just play Helldivers 2 Hell instead of doing too? like these five other things we have to do? Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. And I mean, it really does come down to just they're they're combining all the best elements of what a live service game can be and then live storytelling. Um, the current thing where everyone's working together to establish these bug like spray things on all these planets uh and it's like at least four planets in the bug system uh it is like that's such a cool idea i mean they did that same thing with the mechs where it's like if you liberate this one planet everyone works on this one planet we could unlock the mechs and they uh, everyone unlocked it early because everyone was so excited to play it that's really that's really neat yeah a hundred percent and like you know uh we 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 mentioned hell divers 2 as like a game that you would pick up to play with friends but i think the way so far, in my experience, in like randomly lobbying up with uh, randos and mostly everyone else's experience, it's been positive. Yep. Surprisingly enough, of like a bunch of chill people wanting to play a unchill game and just yeah. like cooperate together. The, the like the what ha like the worst things that happened to me in that game when I when I started up with randos is. Uh, the guy that is level 27 and, you know, I'm playing with 17 and 12 and I'm like, I was like level seven. Uh, when we died, he just went for like a solid three minutes of just doing not his own thing. He was doing the mission, but he like let us stay dead until like, he's like, okay, well, I've got everything, uh, you know, set the way I wanted to. Now I'll bring you back. And it's like, oh, I'd mm -hmm. like to play the video game I'm trying to play. Um, but it's like, that's, you know, the most extreme. And, and I am like, at a certain point, I get it. Like I'm level seven, he's level twenty-seven. Uh, I get it to a certain extent. Uh, up next, uh, still part of this story: GTA Six is most important game release in industry's history, according to analysts. This is from Haley Williams at Gamespot. The games industry isn't in the best shape at the moment, with cost-cutting measures leading to layoffs, studio closures, and game cancellations. And there are few major titles on the way to shore up sales. In an interview with GamesIndustry.biz, industry analyst Matt Piscatella has said that GTA 6 might end up being an incredibly important release for the industry at large. Piscatella, who works for tracking firm Circana, says 2024 isn't looking great for the games industry with overall spend expected to be down that aforementioned 2 to 10%, depending on how optimistic you are. There's so much uncertainty when you look at the sales data or look to project this year, Piscatella said. There's uncertainty around hardware, uh, as he said previously. He does go on to talk about GTA 6 being the thing that everyone was looking forward to holding up this year and now moving beyond, out of the fiscal year. So like after, Mar or, you know, out of March of next year. Uh, so sometime later in 2025. So it's like, man, that has already begun to slip. That makes it feel like even further away. And people that were like, hey, survive 20, or to survive until 25. That was like the mantra. It's like, well, as the Switch 2 gets pushed out and as GTA 6 gets pushed out and uh, the excitement around games could wane if there isn't like that big game pulling people's interest back in. A lot of people are like, man, well, what is going to happen here? How important do you think GTA 6 is though? Because I, I, I have some thoughts here, but what's like your gut reaction? Uh, I realize that I live in a bubble and uh, I am a dirty hipster in the year of 2024 yeah. of... <laughs> I'm going to pull a Jeff Backler and say, like, I don't care. It's not important to me. Yeah. Um, but when that initial GTA 6 teaser trailer dropped a couple months ago, um, I was seeing friends out of the woodwork that I didn't know played video games. Yep. Reposting that trailer saying, oh, y'all don't know how much GTA means to me. Right. And then I was <laughs> thinking, like, that is an insane sentiment. But maybe I'm the insane one. Grub, we were talking about this uh, on the Bombcast, I believe, of like a sequel not quite living up to its predecessor. And I don't think that GTA 6 will fall fall under that banner. Not I'm more yeah. curious about how they will handle the transition of GTA Online. Because I feel like GTA Online has huge an insanely question. huge audience that how do you handle that pivot from 5 to 6? Like, I, I, I'm curious as to, to know what that on-ramp process looks like for rockstar yeah i mean th i think that's that's one of the things that makes it the most important right is that there is yeah. this uh juggernaut money printing factory in gta online and they need to figure out that transition of what it looks like if there is a transition or if it's like no here's a big update to gta online 
and you can a access that through GTA 6. Um, but for me, I look at the I look at this as yeah, GTA 6 is a harbinger of what is going to happen with the biggest games, and like it'll tell us a lot about how much like what is the ceiling here? How big mm -hmm. and expensive can a game be? before it even doesn't make sense for GTA 6. And I think we're probably gonna find GTA 6 is gonna be fine. Rockstar is gonna make their money here, but that mm -hmm. game's gonna come out, and I think a lot of other publishers and developers are gonna look at it and be like, there's no world in which we could do that. I think that's already happened with like Red Dead Redemption 2, where a lot of developers and publishers look, look at that and be like, so much work went into the details of that game that it it is beyond it's incomprehensible how much money it would take for us to do something like that we already like we don't have necessarily the skill or the desire to do those things if we had to keep up with the joneses and the joneses being rock star that would be mm -hmm. like a non-starter um but it's like i think gta 6 is the most important for this old guard of making games in a certain way and i think it is going to kind of like be like hey this is yeah this is what it can do but it, in the meantime, I think there will be this whole other torrent of things off to the side happening in Steam Early Access and, frankly, mobile and a bunch of other places where it's like, uh, yeah, GTA 6, important, but the industry has grown and changed and shifted so much that it's only so important to a certain segment now. Yeah, it feels weird kind of putting it or, or, or putting it that way because now I'm thinking the industry is in such a disarray that I don't think any other studio, maybe Sony, could try and pull off something to the 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 caliber that uh, GTA 6 is going to be, even right. Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, that, is there even a possibility, Grub, that like a GTA 7 is in the, like, in the future at all? Because uh, like, this mm. is an expensive game that has taken forever, Grub. And even... We we know Rockstar is going to make their money back. They're they're going to continue to make their money back with even GTA Five still um, helping fund GTA Six. But like Grand Theft Auto Seven just seems like uh, an imaginary thing. It doesn't feel like a real thing that will ever exist because like this may be the last of like you said those old guard games. This is like a Scorsese flick. Yeah, yeah, and I I agree. I think that um. GTA 6 will come out, and I legit believe it'll be closer to 20 years before we get GTA 7. Like, cool. I I really believe that. Um, and unless, you know, they completely change the way that they're, they're, that model works, where it's like, oh, no, here's GTA 7, and it's something you go by, but it feeds into this larger connected GTA universe that it mostly lives online. They could do something like that, but their efforts have been have been better spent getting more people into GTA Online because that makes them more consistent money over time. Uh, so I, I think that they are setting this game up to last for a very long time. GTA 5 already was 10 years, right? I mean, we're talking longer than that, 11 years now uh, in that range. Yeah, I think yeah. 11 years. Um, so that, yeah, at least 15 years. I'm really, I really think that's very likely for G between GTA 6 and GTA 7. Uh, moving on here. Be around anymore. I I know. That's how I'm like. I was like. I was thinking in those terms. Like, maybe I see GTA Seven, but the idea of a GTA Eight is impossible. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> uh, Summer Game Fest is, is set to start June seventh. This was for Ben Lyons at Game Reactor. Jeff Keighley has officially announced the date and time for when Summer Game Fest will be airing its live showcase this year. The major conference will be held at YouTube Theater once again in Los Angeles and will be set for June 7th, 2024 at, uh, I think this is like 2 p.m. Pacific time, I think is what this is, around there. Uh, they have, uh, this story says 2200 BST and 2300 CEST. Um, Keeley has stated that the event will be approximately two hours long, have a live audience, and of course be streamed around the world on a variety of platforms. Uh, yeah, we, we, like, it always felt like this was around when, when it would happen. It's confirmed. How are you feeling about the summer video game announcement season, Jan? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. I'm tired already. Yep, gonna happen. So, we, 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 listen, we know Microsoft said that they will ha we would have something in that time frame. Uh, they've already confirmed that when they were uh, quelling all the concerns about a couple of games going to PlayStation and, and Switch. Uh, they're like, yeah, we will have our event in June, I think is how they phrased that. Uh, so I think around this same time we could expect that, I, but I'm not, you know I'm not going to be shocked if 
EA and Take Two and all these companies have something around this time. Sony could have something. Nintendo could have a direct. Um, it sure. could feel like a pretty robust announcement season because all these companies still have like th- p- laying people off might it's signify that like hey they, they aren't going to make a lot of games because it's true and they're going to pay for that in a couple years. But I think they're thinking so short term. The way that they look at it is we have so many games about to come out because so much stuff got delayed and our slates are so full. Uh, which is something if you watch that Danny O'Dwyer video about trying to get published, something he heard a lot from publishers when he was trying to get his little game some funding. Um, and it was like, hey, you know, our slate is full, our slate is full. And I think that these companies are like, well, no, we have so many games coming out. And so I think they will have stuff to announce, uh, even though it'll be, I think it's going to feel a little strange coming off all these layoffs. And now it's like, now here, look at, buy all our fucking games. It's going to feel a little weird. Uh, but I, I expect most of these companies to have big events over the summer. Yeah, I for whatever reason, I mean it's it's justified that I'm expecting the there to be a slight uncomfortable vibe in the room of uh it's great that we're all here together. It's great the games are coming out. It's bad everything else. Yeah, because I mean, you know, what what is Summer Games Fest? It is a in what was E3 before that? It like well, E3 was like a, 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 a show where people could connect and do business. Summer Game Fest yeah. is just raw commercialism. It is just raw we are here to sell these corporations video games to the consumer that mm-hmm. is the reason the whole thing exists and um so it's a show not really even for the people who make the games you know he has ga- the game awards for that ostensibly yeah that also turns into this is about selling games to the consumer so that's mm-hmm. like some of the cons- that's like where people have some criticism there but whatever this show just is upfront and honest about no this is for the CEOs trying to find a place to market their games. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's going to make the vibes be a little bit weird as well. But, you know, at, at the same time, I, I, I like to get excited about new, new video games. If the people have, they want to sell video games to me, I'll pay attention to a certain extent, but 2024 is going to continue to be a, a, a situation where uh, it, it is going to be frustrating to have mm-hmm. to listen to these companies market to us when they are not taking care of the people who actually made these yeah. video games. I, I do think you're right, though, that this will be a it feels like this is going to be a bigger um, SGF, not only because of like all these companies have several games in their back pocket that they've been waiting to to release trailers for release hype for uh, just get them out the door and get them off of the release slate. Um, but Summer Game Fest in general has also been growing year by year. Um, last year, it was already double the size it was from the initial year and i can only imagine like keely is looking at a blueprint or maps of downtown la and thinking like all right let's take over that building too um and i i be- and the whole thing is just going to continue to get bigger despite the industry hurting um those marketing dollars got to go somewhere grub right yeah um i think that these companies will still have a pretty significant marketing budget uh that's you know that is a huge cost for them, but I think they, I think they find that the um, Summer Game Fest and the Kiwi stuff is pretty cost effective. Uh, it, it, it does cost a lot of money to get a showcase in their in one of his shows, like a lot of money. Um, but when I talk to like PR people who whose business is, hey, get get attention to this game, um, they're like, yeah, it's worth it. It, it like it gets yeah. it gets enough eyeballs on it. There are you know often millions of people watching live, millions of people watch it later. Uh, it does drive the news. So yeah, I think that you're right. The marketing do- dollars will still go into it, and that's got to go somewhere. Um, so because it ain't coming to me, that's for sure. Oh, um, uh, what, do you, what like do you think that a like Microsoft expect that to be like a full E3 thing. I think that they set the, those expectations. So I, I their showcase, I, and they've done this the last several years, should be a big one. What do you mm-hmm. think the scale of the Nintendo and Sony shows are likely to be? I, I don't know Actually, what to Jan, expect. I, 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 can we take a quick break? I got to get, get a kid off the bus. We'll be right back, everybody. I'm going to be scouting. Grab Fade to Black. No, he didn't Fade to Black. I'm still up here. Do I make my own pizza? No. Uh, folks, 
here, we're on a quest. We're on a quest here today. All right. We're on a quest. And that quest is to be a better version of ourselves than you were yesterday. I've been doing a lot of thinking. I've been doing a lot of staring off into the ocean. And where I live in San Francisco, it is hard to stare into the ocean because it's constantly covered in fog. So I'm just staring at the 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 mystery that is life, the mystery that is the ocean. The ocean that is already vast and wide and huge has become even more vast and wide and huge because I'm just staring at overclass, overcast clouds. And I look within myself and I see nothing but a void, folks. I see nothing but a void. And I want you to look at yourself in the mirror and realize that you're very pretty. You're very handsome. There's so much value in everything. Go buy a churro today. Treat yourself to some cinnamon. That is what the lesson I've learned by staring off into the ocean. Just buy yourself a churro. You'll feel better. The cinnamon helps. What's happening here? I'm having an existential crisis. I started okay. scatting. Uh, and then I, I, everyone buy, go buy a churro. Man, I would, I would really want a churro. How are those subway churros? I don't know. <laughs> Grub, there's a conspiracy theory with those churros and cookies. Oh, hell yeah. What? Big Auntie Anne's is trying to steal our sandwiches. Wait, are they, so they're infiltrating subways with their sweet goods? Yes. Mm. I don't, I mean, listen, I think I'd be all right with that. Hey, Auntie I'm okay with that. Auntie Anne's could take over. All right, catching my breath because I ran up the stairs. Uh, we'll get started here in a second, right back into it. Let me just make sure I'm in the right place. You didn't fade the black. So right. Let me we're fade still it. here. Okay, let's, you know what? Let's do that. And then bring, uh, there we go. Actually, okay, cool. All right, Jan, uh, I was asking you how, what, what scale you expect from Nintendo and Sony for their press conferences at mm -hmm. the Summer Game Fest season, you know, if they even happen. There is no guarantee that they do happen. I think it's probably likely just based on, although I feel like I said this last year with Sony, Sony doesn't have a ton of stuff announced, so they, you know, they probably should and they probably will. And then Nintendo feels like they should set, set stuff up for the second half of this year, even if they're not ready to talk about the Switch 2 quite yet. Uh, what do you think? I feel like Nintendo has to be ready uh, or move themselves into a position to start laying the groundwork for a Switch 2 and get those consumers uh, ready to spend their dollars there. I don't, I don't think they'd be shooting themselves in the foot by announcing it and still uh, planning on releasing big-ish titles, medium-ish titles later in the fall, in winter months. Um, and, you know, we've said this multiple times. I feel like just treat the rest of this year as a victory lap for Nintendo. Just fill out the rest of your, just release the rest of those games. Uh, but make sure you leave clear enough of a runway for whatever the Switch 2 is going to look like. Yeah. I'm so ready for that thing to be announced and a name to be announced. So we stop calling it the Switch 2 um, or Super but, but, Switch. What if it is just called the Switch 2? Well, you know, <laughs> all right, let's do that. <laughs> we could, we said it here first. Um, Sony is the bigger outlier, though, for me, Grub. I don't know what they're going to do because I feel like they've canceled so many projects and everything that they've announced over the last couple of years is like, we're working on like 12 games as a service, live service games. We're working on like so many things, yet we've heard several projects get canceled. That Spider-Man one, um, most recently just getting canned at the Uncharted multiplayer stuff, several, a lot of people getting laid off of, laid off from PlayStation. So I don't yep. know what they have, like Marathon? Yeah, Marathon's ways off. Yeah, that's a ways off. So, um... Yeah, that's a, that's a weird one because it's like they have to get Destiny back into a decent place before they can even really, I think, focus all in on Marathon. Um, they probably will have some announcements, uh, but you, like they, their partnership games like Rise of Ronin, which is a first party game, but like also then like F Final Fantasy, that stuff is out. Um, they will probably have a couple more of those in their pocket. Uh, I just, how many other ga big games is a company like square enix a frequent partner actually working on especially after like 2022 uh, where they had a ton of games that didn't quite hit and so they were like pulling back from that strategy a little bit um i and, and you know and sony has told us flat out this fiscal year up, up through march of 2025 no sequels to ex establish triple a franchises so we know like the one that was most likely would speculate is ghost of tsushima um, mm -hmm. be like, oh, if they had that, that would definitely justify a showcase. So I think when we're talking about the scale of these shows, 
if Sony has something, I think it's probably a state of play. And then we do get something like that Astro game announced in there. Now, they do also have, allegedly, and you know, and based on good reporting, uh, a PlayStation 5 Pro that should launch this year. Um, how do you launch that without having a bunch of games to go along with it? I don't necessarily know. But, you know, the, the audience that wants a PS5 Pro will just show up and buy a PS5 Pro, especially in this first holiday. Um, mm-hmm. So they, that's probably not going to stop them. Uh, and th- that's the kind of thing that could show up in a showcase. It could maybe justify a showcase if they have a couple of games ready to go with it. But I don't I don't know, man. You're right. I, I, it's really hard to yeah. guess what it could be. I mean, we were pleasantly surprised with um, Valhalla dropping out of nowhere. Um, and I'm trying to think like, all right, what other PlayStation games have not already made its way out onto the PC? Where can they cover their bases there? Um, what else can you add a roguelike mode to? Because they already did yeah. that as well with The Last of Us Part Two. Yeah, um, they, they did that with something else too, didn't they? Like uh, the same like God of War. God of War, yeah. Uh, I don't know how the, you know, we're not the biggest fans of Horizon here at GB, but I guess you could ham fist a roguelike mode into that somehow. Um, I don't know. Maybe you could even do that with Ratchet and Clank, and that'd be fun. That could be cool. Ooh, that'd be cool. That would be cool. Yeah. There's so many fun weapons in there. Uh, that'd yeah. be that'd be great. Sony had a uh, like like the Sony account did like this uh, tournament of most popular PlayStation franchises, and Horizon didn't do very well. <laughs> I was like, hey, I'm like, am I being gaslighted by this in- I, industry? I, I I feel like a little bit. I think so. Like, I don't know what it is. Like, I want to see what people see in Horizon. Yeah. But I can't yet. There's a big audience, but not a big audience. I don't I don't know. And it's not Was like Jim uh, Ryan just buying a bunch of copies. Yeah. Him and Herman Hulse were just going from target to target road tripping. That sounds like a good time. They Here's what we need to get hang. to go to get PlayStation to go back and get into the butter zone with with everyone. Hell yeah. Kill zone. Yeah. Uh, no, no, that was a joke. Don't no, let's I, not bring kill zone back. I'm like, would they, I, I wonder if they would ever bring back kill zone or uh, the one that everyone, like, I guess really wants is resistance. So calm. So, oh, well, resistance. so calm. So calm. Yes. That's the one everyone really wants. It's the first thing that got mentioned in chat was so calm. Um, so yeah, I, they, they probably do consider bringing back one of these shooters, but I guess now that they own Bungie, maybe they, maybe they aren't thinking that way. I don't know. Uh, all right. Embracer Group sells Saber Interactive for a cool $247 million. This is from Sophie McAvoy at gamesindustry.biz. This is a follow-up to like a, a, like reporting and then uh, evidence of like, hey, Saber removed a bunch of stuff from their website. And the reporting was like, hey, they sold the, they bought themselves out for $500 million. No, $247 million. As announced by the firm in a statement published today, it has agreed to divest selected assets from Saber to Beacon Interactive a new company founded by Sabre's co-founder, Matthew Kark. Arch? Kark. Uh, Sabre will retain a number of studios as part of the sale, including Nimble Giant, 3D Realms, Sandbox Strategies, New World Interactive, Slipgate, Madhead Games, Fractured Byte, and Digic. Uh, as for Embracer, the firm will keep the following studios. Zen Studios, 4A Games, although I think um, for both of those... When 4A Games is the Metro Studios, Zen Studios is the uh, that pinball studio, the, the video game pinball. Um, Saber seems to have an option to eventually buy those two studios later if they want. Uh, Embrace will also keep Tripwire, uh, Beamdog, who does a lot of did a lot of those um, uh, 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 old computer RPG re- remasters. Uh, Tuxedo Labs, Demiurge, Shiver, Aspire, which just did the, that Star well, does a lot of the Star Wars remasters. A uh, snapshot in 34 big things. It will also retain IPs, it I think being Embracer, and future publishing rights for a variety of titles, including various announced AAA and AA projects in addition to Killing 4-3 and Teardown. One of those uh, projects that uh, Embracer will have a hand in and will co-own with uh, Saber is an, a, a previously announced AAA game based on a franchise, and everyone's speculating that's the Knights, of, Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, so that is going with Saber, but they are still going to work with Embracer on it to some extent. And I'll say what I've been saying from from what I've heard for weeks now: Sony's not interested in seeing that thing through, or at least at least not as it stands today. That could change, mm-hmm. but um, that when when I said that thing was done, it was it was done with Sony. Um, they continued to try to make it happen, though. Um, hey, they extracted themselves from from uh, uh, Embracer. Embracer is keeping about half the studios here. 
Um, so that probably explains why the price tag is $247 million to buy, buy themselves out. Um, but yeah, I, I'm glad many of these studios were able to get out from Embracer, and I hope that Embracer is keeping many of these studios because they want them and want them to make games and isn't just going to like lay them off later. That would stink. Uh, it smells stinky already, Grub. It smells pretty stinky lie. over there in Embracer land. Yes. Maybe we, maybe, you know, there should be a higher ranking official group of folks that are like, nah, we, we won't, we're not going to let you buy these people. Uh, and hey, look at this from this morning. Jason Schreier mentioned that uh, Saber CEO Matthew Karch confirms that they've already decided to take 4A and Zen Studios, despite the messaging from Embracer suggesting that it may retain those two studios. So that's already happened. So Met I, I, I think what's weird here, though, is I think Metro is going to stay with Embracer. I, I would have to like sort this out uh, and, and know exactly, but there's going to be some like figuring out what this all means for the studios and the IPs that they're most frequently associated with. Um, but I, I hope that's not the case because you know, 4A would, would definitely want to see that stuff through. And it, you know, at the very least, if, if Embracer does keep it, 4A would likely have a deal in place to just continue to work on it. Um, yeah, I, it's it smells stinky over at Embracer. It is uh, a, a a publisher that is looking to continually cut costs. And I think um, if I were in a situation here where it's like if I had to go with Saber or stay with Embracer, I, I would easily choose. Let's go. It, let's go it on our own. Let's see if we can go figure it out. Mm -hmm. I know there's no funding out there, uh, but we were able to get investments to to buy ourselves out from from Embracer. Let's just see if we can make some money selling some video games. Um, and a lot of the studios yeah. that are still at, 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 at Saber, you know, it's a, it's a pretty massive organization, you know, that all those mm -hmm. like, you know, 3d realms and stuff. So yeah, I, I think that they could probably make some big up things. Yes. 34 big things. Um, well, we'll see how this continues to fall out though. It is, uh, confusing over at Embracer mostly because it just makes no sense from the ground up what they did over there. It, it like, how are they making money? Are they making they're, money? They're do not. they know what they're doing? Do they, they know they're in the games industry? I don't think they do. No, they were in the uh, organic growth of acquiring businesses industry, and now that's dried up on them. Do they uh, want to organically acquire me for a couple months and then I just leave? Right, and then you buy yourself back for half the price. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like a good plan. I'm a, I'll do that. Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown reveals post-launch roadmap. Uh, this is from Nintendo Everything. And this is interesting. This game's getting quite a bit of DLC. More content is in store for Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown, with a few free updates and even and an even bigger piece of DLC. The first update, Warrior's Path, is planned for this month. It include a speedrun mode, permadeath mode, and new Sargon outfits. The second update, Boss Attack, is slated for this spring. It'll include a boss rush mode and another round of Sargon outfits. The Divine Trials update will close things out in the summer. This will be comprised of new combat platform and puzzle challenges, which that's music to my ears because I really enjoyed yeah. those things in the game. There will also be new amulets, Sargon outfits, and more. For the DLC, Ubisoft is keeping things close to the vest. We know it'll include story, but nothing else is known at this point. So it's full-on story DLC, which I'm surprised they're doing. Happy they're doing it, though. Glad yeah. this game is getting support. I, I hope fans show back up for it but I, I will i'm definitely going to be there for a lot of this stuff uh yeah I, i'll i'll check out that speed run mode at the mode a little bit uh but I, those challenges sound great to me and then story a continuation of the story i you know the story was okay but at the mm -hmm. very like at the very least it's like giving me new places to explore is that what we're doing here that would be great too this is definitely on the top of my list to like circle back around and revisit once uh things kind of slow down after what dragon's dogma 2 perhaps mm -hmm. Um, I, I just remember I just lost steam so hard, uh, uh, like maybe halfway through this game, but I hope with the new DLC plans being revealed and when that comes out, it also breathes new life into it with more people flocking to it for the first time. Agreed. Yeah. And I think that's one of these, one of the things that happens here is you add in all this content and then you could put out a definitive mode later. Again, that gives you another chance to reintroduce the game to people, make it feel like an even better deal. You can cut the price then, and it's like, well, this is good. This has all the DLC, and it's only you know thirty dollars instead of forty dollars. Think you, there's a good chance you get a bunch of people to hop on board at that point. Which hey, I, I hope they pull that trigger. Uh, grab a, a couple of folks are mentioning this in the chat, but no plans at all to release this on Steam, huh? 
Yeah, they, at least they're in not, the foreseeable future. They are. They did not mention that, right? So this is, continues to be on uh, Ubisoft Play. I think you uh, is it called Uplay Play still? Um, yes. Yeah, they are uh, Ubisoft Connect. Is I think the new name. Um, yeah, they, they that's where you have to play it on on PC. So and which is weird because Ubisoft goes back and forth with releases on Steam, uh, mm -hmm. like from game to game. So I, this game seems like it would greatly benefit from being on Steam, but maybe that's what happens with that definitive version. Maybe they release all this stuff, and at that point, you put it out on Steam a year later. Oh, not a bad idea. Uh, okay, I, I put this story in here, Jan, mostly as a question. Uh, Monopoly Go has hit $2 billion in revenue in just 10 months after launch. This is from Dean Takashi at GamesBeat. Mm -hmm. Scopely mm -hmm. announced that Monopoly Go has generated $2 billion in revenue just 10 months after launch, three months after hitting $1 billion. The reimagined take on Hasbro's iconic board game has garnered a massive player base, solidifying its place as a beloved, highly engaging title in the free-to-play market. It's a big score, not only for Scopely, but its new owner, Savvy Games Group, which is uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, Jan, have you ever heard of Monopoly Go? Yes, because okay. when, All I'm right. scrolling, I was wondering. when I'm scrolling on TikTok, these are the worst UGC user-generated content ads I have ever seen. Okay. They're getting the bottom of the barrel. Oh, those low kind. tier Z TikTokers, influencers, whatever, uh, to make the worst edited content to promote this game. And I've only ever heard about this game in those poorly edited ads. Say perhaps you visit um, different websites, right? Uh -huh. we'll, we'll all infer what I mean by different websites. Uh-huh. No, exactly. We're used, we're used to and conditioned for those different websites to have those different types of ads with them. Those ads also have Monopoly Go ads. What the hell? Really? <laughs> yes. So I feel like they're getting Gen Z. They're getting the freaks and pervs visiting freaks those different websites. Big, big market, yeah. I, uh, those, I've never those, actually played this game. No, I, yeah, I've never. I didn't even look at it until I saw the story. I saw $2 billion. Um, I did install it, though. I'm going to try it out uh, for myself. Uh those Gen Z ads, uh, the bad ones on TikTok where someone's like, uh, oh, a comet said this is fake. Well, I'm going to go check it out myself and prove to you it's not, even though it totally 100% is fake. Um, mm -hmm. Those, they, I think they work. <laughs> they seem to really work. Uh, they just capture some sort of audience. And I wonder if it's like, uh, an, I mean, it's on TikTok. So how old, uh, how much older of an audience can it be? I think it's the tricking other Gen Zers. So yeah, that's uh, it's a, a wild one that that is but so effective. Like the type of game that it looks like Monopoly Go is based off of looking at screenshots and the gameplay footage, I guess I've seen from those ads. It seems like the perfect game catered to the boomer audience. Yeah, right. That's what I figured games. too. Yeah. I, and I bet they're, I bet they are the biggest audience on there likely. Uh, but you don't get the 2 billion in revenue without having a wide, huge swath of the, of people playing. Um, I did Google Monopoly Go and the autofill is, Monopoly Go free dice, so I'm assuming free di dice are, is like your currency, uh, you know, V bucks or whatever, or maybe the thing you need to just play the game in the first place. It, um, it also sh it also shows like a, a, a Monopoly board with like different people on there, so there is like some live multiplayer element. Uh, I don't know, but two billion dollars in ten months is a uh, buck wild. That is nuts. So that is, I, you, it's hard to like most huge new mobile games come out. And they're aiming to do about a billion dollars in the first year, which is huge on its own. Two billion dollars in less time than that is crazy. I'm curious, Grub. Where do you f fall uh, on Monopoly, the board game? Do you like it? Do you hate it? I don't know if I've like ever played like the shoot rules. Um, so I kind of feel like I'm I'm not. I would be like, oh I, yeah, it's not great, but I wonder if I've just played weird house rules that actually ruin the game. Um, mm -hmm. So I I don't know. I I. I was thinking about I would like to play Risk again. Uh, Risk is one I played a lot as a as a kid and enjoyed with my older brothers. Um, so I'm like I want to check back in on Risk and maybe it's time to do Monopoly as well. Are th are those games in Tabletop Simulator or are they too basic? I just no. I feel like everything is in Tabletop Simulator. All right. Well, we need to have a board game night or something. Uh, board game board game yeah. week. Yeah. Uh, we yeah we should do. 
we should do that. That'd be actually pretty neat. Like, yeah. uh, we, we do that trivial pursuit, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. poker, drinking shoots and ladders. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but bo board game oh, week uh, we, sounds like fun. We also, you know, should eventually play wingspan as a crew because we we, we talked about it so much. Uh, also, Tam has like twelve hundred board games that he continues to buy. We need him oh, to I take the plastic off a, some of them. I didn't know he was like a secret sicko. I, I, he's never he never even talks about that. That's Have how you know seen, it's a real sicko ness. Have you seen Tam? That guy's a sicko. Well, I didn't know he was a sicko in that way. So you know, like no. a sicko in multiple uh, multifaceted ways. I just didn't know his board games as well. Tam only functions in sicko mode. That's right. That's it's his only gear. Uh. Embracer suggests Star Wars KOTOR, KOTOR Remake isn't coming out for over a year. This is from Tom Ivan at VGC. The Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic Remake is reportedly still in development at Saber Interactive, but it doesn't sound like it will be released in the next 12 months. In it. No. On Thursday, Embracer Group announced plans to sell off a large part of Saber, the group which is home to multiple studios and projects, in a deal that could be worth up to $500 million. While Embracer will retain Aspire Media, the studio originally enlisted to enlisted to make the Knights of the Old Republic remake. Uh, the game, uh, yeah, the game is going with Saber, according to Bloomberg's Jason Schreier, who previously reported that the company had taken over development. Never, nevertheless, when the deal closes and Embracer and Saber start, uh, part ways. KOTOR is expected to be jointly held asset between the two companies. In today's announcement of the deal, Embracer said it's retained assets, including two joint projects with the buyer, including a previously announced AAA game based on a major license. In a conference call discussing the deal, Embracer CEO Lars Wingerfers, brain genius, was quizzed about the jointly held AAA projects on a couple of occasions. One analyst asked if it was expected to come out in the next 12 months or whether it was a more distant release. And he said, no, I think that kind of game needs more deep love and respect. So without giving full color, I think it's some time left until that is released. Color is always something that, that these guys say to analysts and analysts say in their questions. Can I get some more color on that? Um, yeah, uh, deep love and respect is what that game needs. Uh, yeah, the, I think I wouldn't expect that game before like 2027 if it ever really happens. Yeah, I've uh, I've resigned that if I am going to pick up and play KOTOR, it's just going to be whatever version exists right now on the internet versus waiting for a remaster yeah, to pop totally up. totally fine. It's, it's, you know, it's an older game, but it holds up, checks out. I, there's... KOTOR show. Mm. Well, we're still workshopping the name. Oh, but yeah, but yeah, man, if, if you want to play that game, I will sit there and watch you play it, and I will, I will STF you Friday uh, while you do that so that we could see, uh, see your reactions, because I think that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, finally, yeah, this is, this is a finally Overwatch two fans think one or, th or th think the cowboy skins are, uh, excuse me, cowboy bebop skins are goofy as hell in the game, but especially one of them uh, is from Ken Shepard at Kotaku Overwatch two's latest collaboration is with the beloved space Western anime cowboy bebop. The event, which kicked off on March 12th, lets five heroes from Blizzard's team based shooter cosplay as different characters from the classic 90s show. The event follows in the footsteps of other crossover events, like like October 23 one that featured K-pop group uh, Le Seraphim. Uh, for this latest crossover, five heroes, Cassidy, Sombra, Ash, Mauga, and Recky Ball, each get a skin and a few other cosmetics, each come packaged in a $25 bundle. Um, but some of the new skin, well, some of those new skins are great. Uh, I played a few rounds with uh, Damage Hero Samba dressed up as Bebop's fellow hacker Ed last night and had a bonding moment with a Masaga player wearing the Jet Black skin. So, but some Overwatch fans aren't too fond of the new Cassidy skin, which dresses him up as Bebop main character Spike Spiegel. Have you have you seen this, Jan? I'm looking at screenshots now, and it looks okay. Unless yeah. I'm I'm not seeing like the one that folks are complaining about the most. So what people are mostly, uh, I think they're mostly frustrated with the hair, I think. I, you know, in general, he just kind of looks a bit goofy. But um, I think people are, like, annoyed that he kind of has what looks like the wrong hair. Uh, and, yeah, it's kind of, like, too spiky on the top and doesn't have, like, the swoop that Spike Spiegel's hair has. Uh, I, okay. I will, I'll say in general, I, I do think these kind of look a little bit, eh. Like, they're not, I don't know. It may, maybe in motion, they look a lot better. It looks like... It looks like they're just doing poor cosplay. 
Yes, it looks like poor cosplay. Yes, um, but <laughs> yeah, there's th this one here where it's like, please fix the hair, and it's like, yeah, if you kind of actually just did that, although it looks like this also uh, uh, modified the face a little bit as well. Uh, but if you just fix the hair, that would be a huge win there in terms of making him look more like Spike Spiegel. Uh, really though, Jan, twenty five dollars for these skin packs these days. That's that is where we're at. That, that's that's like, each. Yeah. Oh. I think $25 each. Whoa, no, don't do that. That's Consumers just, at home, don't do that. Consumers at home, save yourselves. Uh, there, let me tell y'all, if you just just go watch the original anime. Crap, I've never seen it. But uh, there's tons of pictures of, uh, what's her name, Faye out there on the internet. I know that y'all are just trying to look at Faye on, in Overwatch. Just, just go do that somewhere else. Jane, you gotta watch it, man. It's, it's, it's one season, bud. It's worth it. It's so worth it. I'm afraid uh, it's Jeff gonna change Baglar's my whole personality. It. That's fair. It's really good. Cowboy Bebop. Man, I like that show a whole bunch. Um, I, I, we're gonna do another story. Sea of Stars reached 5 million copies. Uh, but uh, I think they, they added a three-player cooperative mode uh, where it's like you can like, time the hits in the turn-based combat all together. And that, that sounds pretty neat. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna play a whole turn-based like JRPG J it, with, with, you know, a cooperative partners, but it's cool that it's in there. Cool mode. Or J I guess JRPG style, I should say. Uh, Grub, uh, there was a tweet linked out in the chat. It looks like the Apex Legends team had, uh, got, had faced a bunch of layoffs today. I'm trying to find that Ooh, now. Really? Okay. Let me, uh, well, look for that. I'll look as well. Uh, man, that is, that would, be terrible. Okay, let's see here. Uh, yeah, the Apex team was hit with layoffs today. It sucks seeing some of the people I've worked with for almost three years now get let go. Hopefully they land on their feet sooner rather than later, and that is from 15 hours ago, and that was a level designer at Respawn, um, Aaron Stump, who tweeted that. Um, um, got another tweet here from Alex Ackerman, uh, who ran social media for apex after 20 seasons of apex and five years at respawn nearly to the day my job has been made redundant and i've been laid off uh and then uh working on this game and supporting this community has truly been the honor of my career and highlight of my life thank you for everything legends heart emoji uh geez yeah uh Connor Ford, who was a security analyst on Apex Legends, said, tired of these layoffs, man. Losing friends at work is so effed up. Um, yeah, respawn build engineer Tyler Owens. That's who you mentioned, I think. Uh, yeah, so this is on top of the layoffs that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. And at that time, it was, A, EA's laying off 5% of people. And I remember mentioning, like, I thought more would happen because I, I knew a lot of that was in the um, consultation period in places like Europe uh, where they have those sorts of things. Like, the UK has, you know, you can't just lay people off. you got to go in this consultation and talk to the government and explain what's going on. Uh, so it's like, once they got through that period, they probably cut some of those jobs. That This doesn't seem to be that. This just seems to be... Uh, there are more people we need to lay off. We, we left some people around here that we could have cut in the last round. I don't know. Um, Apex Legends, again, is something that they are looking at as not being able to reach the heights it was once at. They aren't looking at it in terms of, this is EA. It, they look at, at Apex Legends and like, it's not gonna necessarily grow. We're just trying to extract as much value from it as possible. And in their opinion, I guess what that means is, have fewer people making stuff for the game and so you have the fewer people you have to pay and again that's just it's just nuts because a apex legends is something you could definitely keep going for much longer there and they just talked about how they're going to um it's gonna like the launcher is gonna have a ton more stuff in there it's gonna grow beyond the confines of battle royale uh i'm not really buying it which i you know we kind of weren't buying it any anyhow because we already knew that titanfall legends which was eff effectively titanfall 3 they are making that to be a part of Apex Legends, similar to what they're talking about now. They canceled that, which everyone was into what they were making with that. Um, they canceled that. So it's like, okay, they're already looking at, okay, well, this isn't worth it. The Apex Legends is, isn't going to make enough money back for that. So when they talk about we're, we're going to continue supporting Apex Legends and, and growing it in different ways, that feels like lip service at best. Yeah, All right. I, I just don't know how God... 
the the, the job pool is is so vast and yeah. wide now, Greg. Yep, and it's going to uh, it is it, yeah. This is going it's going to be rough out there because there's a lot of talented people going for the same jobs, and it's and you know it's not like if if you don't have a name, if you don't have um, a big executive producer, director, senior developer credit on shipping a major game. Like if you if you got laid off from Riot and you worked on League of Legends, you're gonna have a little bit easier time. But these days, even those people are gonna struggle to get investments to start up their own studios. So yeah, I, it's it, it's a lot of people are gonna end up out of the video game industry. Is what it feels like, and that's just that just stinks. All right. Poll question uh, from yesterday. Is Mega Man important? Uh, I'm going to refresh that real quick because uh, we get 3,000 votes. And I voted yes, and so did 64% of respondents, Mike. So All don't right. worry. 36% uh, said it's not important. I was waiting important. with bated breath there. I, my, yes. my tummy started hurting. I was, uh, I was hoping he wouldn't get too mad. Um, I think Mega Man is important. I don't know how important it is that, to, to like Capcom's game-making strategy, but I think as... An icon as a a, a a mascot, it's very important, and it can be important to games. Probably just not as important as Monster Hunter or Resident Evil these days. Um, next poll question for tomorrow, Friday, Dreg's Day. Have you ever heard of Monopoly Go? Have you heard of Monopoly Go? Yes or no? Answer that question. Don't count it if you heard it on this show. If that was the first place you ever heard it, uh, say no. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, yes. but, we will discuss the results of that, though, on Game Mess Mornings here on Giant Bomb tomorrow. Speaking of Giant Bomb, Jan, what do we have going on on the website? We are going to attempt to throw it down on a Thursday night. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Afternoon uh, with Star Wars Battlefront, specifically the PC version. I understand that there's a very small amount of servers available, um, which, hey, you know. Can I make a, a custom it, 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 server? Because I'm paying for one for Pal World still. Grub, stop paying for the custom server in Power yeah, World. It, it, it was a three month thing, so it hasn't okay. expired yet. That's what it is. Okay. I mean, I shouldn't okay. have paid. I shouldn't have bought three months in the first place, Jan. But hey, no, yeah. no, 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 that was a mistake. Uh, voicemail dump truck popping off later today. Tomorrow, another episode of Game Mess Mornings, as well as an episode of UPF, where we are doing a Bellatro, uh seeded run, and then BCR as well to cap off the week. Or we'll talk about wrestling games. Talk about them wrestling games. Um, all right. I think that's going to do it. Uh, Jan, thank you so much for spending today talk with me about video games. I really appreciate it. It's the only way to start a Thursday, Grub. And thank you all out there for listening. You're the best audience in gaming. Until next time, have a good one. Take care of yourself. And goodbye. Paint the black. All right, well, let's pull that plug and that one.